So I get a lot of questions about how I do this. How do I film? What do I film with? What are the lights that I use? All of that. And let me tell you, I'm not so good at this. <laughs> I've been doing it for many years. But uh, I'm talking into my iPhone that I have on a stand. I have my notebook right here um, propped up so I can see what's on the screen. I have, I think, pretty good lighting around here. It seems to work pretty well. And uh, <clears throat> how do I prepare? Well, I usually have something in mind, usually have, um, usually have a title, and I go off of that. I have a question that I read. I might have a couple things for notes, usually not. I have a scripture picked out and I just talk. I don't edit. I don't do any of that. I have a template that I put it all in and I get it done between my talk and then editing, not editing, but putting it all together and then uploading. It's maybe 30 minutes. I know, I don't take much time with it. And then the other question that people ask is, um, how do I continue to be so good looking? Okay, well, not everybody asks that. Well, okay, well, somebody wanted to know how i so good at looking into the camera. And is there anyone else here? There isn't anyone else here. It is right now 4.30 in the morning. I do this very early. I study and I do it. And because Sanctuary is international ministry, I need to get up early so I can catch people at different time zones all over. So I'm an early to rise, early to bed kind of guy. And uh, so I'm the only one here and thank you. But I know you're there. And I know you're there listening, and I appreciate it, and I imagine you on the other side of the camera, and thank you for joining me for Pastor Bob's Coffee Break. Hurt people, hurt people. That's something else we're going to talk about today. Of course, in that mug, Headbangers Brew, our very own coffee that is used, the proceeds are used to support the homeless ministry and the whole bean uh, <laughs> ground decaf, K-cups, I almost forgot. I say it every day. And uh, folks, we have the coolest shirts here, the new Sanctuary shirts. Sanctuary, we are metal, we are family, and uh, isn't that cool? It's with our good friend, Metal Dude, and he's also on a travel mug and other things. You can find all of this stuff in our store, we are metal, we are family. Dot com. Lots of cool stuff coming as well. Can't wait for you to see it. And uh, again, all the money from all of that goes to support the homeless ministry. Well, here's the question for today. Two of them, actually, that are very close, and I thought I'd include them both. Dear Pastor Bob, your recent bit on sexual predators reminded me of some things from a recent discussion. Our God is a God of restoration and redemption. I'm a living example of that. However, in light of that, what is your view on sexual predators that repent and come to Christ and what areas of ministry they might hold, i.e. having a, a formerly convicted pedophile teach children or youth classes, pulpit ministry, or having those who have a history of infidelity doing counseling. I ask because there are those in my home church uh, on the sexual offenders registry 
I know former pastors that were unfaithful in marriage, as well as I know two former pastors in my area that were pedophiles. Good question. Here's another one. I watched your Facebook video, and they're talking about the the one that I did on pedophiles and the guy, how do we restore him? And I think to feel more, I think we should feel more sorry for the children who have been abused than for the pedos. Just saying, I'm a satanic ritual abuse survivor and suffered brain damage and borderline personality disorder. I'm on medication. They almost murdered me from age three until 17. I can't even imagine. I'm so sorry you went through that. And these are great comments and great questions, and I get it. Well, it's a little grim when you look at people who struggle. People who struggle with sexual um, uh, abuse and and uh, sexual infidelity and pornography and all of those things, it's really a dopamine thing. And, you know, Christians get caught up in this stuff all the time. It's, it's the same as being addicted to cocaine in your head. It's a difficult addiction. Pedophiles are the worst for rehabilitation. And um, the success rate after going through counseling and whatever that a pedophile will not uh, act out again is only 4%. I know. The odds are not good. 96% will return. And even that 4% is debatable among psychologists. Well, you say, well, what if they become a Christian and God restores them? Absolutely. But even Christians get caught up in their own impulses. And when we invite Jesus into our hearts, have you noticed you didn't become perfect? Some of the same struggles are there, but now you have God to help you fight through the struggles. That's why we talk about all of these things like fight the battle before the battle. You know you're going to fight it again. Fight it in your mind and know what to do when you get there. Threshold thinking, take every thought captive at the threshold of your of your mind. We've gone through these things so many times because we continue to struggle. And if you're honest with yourself, you know that you still struggle with things you've struggled with for a long time. Many of you who have become Christians during uh, the adult phase of your life will remember that there's some things you struggled with before that you still do. And if it was that easy, listen, then over 80% of the guys, Christian guys, who struggle with pornography wouldn't have a struggle. 80% do. So what about this? What about the 4% success rate? That's not good odds. And just become a just because a person becomes a Christian doesn't mean they're over their addictions. And we keep doing that. We keep putting people in ministry who are still struggling, who have not had full healing. And and if you struggle with that, if there's an addiction, there's usually a cover-up and there's usually deceit and all kinds of things involved. And have they gotten over that too? It's a long time of healing. As I said, it's a dopamine addiction, the same as cocaine. Well, what does the Bible have to say about qualifications for being a leader? Because that's a whole different thing. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 1, and it says, This is a faithful and trustworthy saying. If any man eagerly seeks the office of overseer, a bishop, superintendent, we call them pastors, he desires an excellent task. Now an overseer must be blameless, beyond reproach. Are you getting this? 
the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, not a bully, nor quick-tempered or hot-headed, but gentle and considerate, free from the love of money. I can think of so many pastors who are disqualified already, honestly. Not greedy for wealth and its inherent power, financially ethical. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity, keeping them respectful and well-behaved. For if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And he must not be a new convert so that he will not behave stupidly and become conceited by appointment to his high office and fall into the same condemnation incurred by the devil for his arrogance and his pride. And he must have a good reputation and be well thought of by those outside the church so that he will not be discredited and fall into the devil's trap. Have you noticed that there are very few people who would qualify? Yes, very few. Not everybody is going to be a pastor or a leader among God's people. Not everybody has to. It's a very specific office. I want to read this from the message commentary. I like how it says it here. If anyone wants to provide leadership in the church, good. But there are preconditions. A leader must be well thought of, committed to his wife, cool and collected. By the way, when I say committed to his wife, I mean committed in every way putting her first before the ministry, before anything else. That's an abuse I see a lot. And committed to his wife emotionally and sexually. Is he committed to his wife if he's addicted to porn? No. Cool and collected, accessible, hospitable. He must know what he's talking about, not be... Uh, over fond of wine or any kind of alcohol or drugs, not pushy, but gentle, not thin skinned, not money hungry. He must handle his own affairs well, attentive to his own children and having their respect. For if someone is unable to handle his own affairs, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a new believer, lest the position go to his head and the devil trip him up. Outsiders must think well of him, or else the devil will figure out a way to lure him into his trap. I like that. You know, I've seen so many abuses with this, and for some reason, our Christian culture loves to hear the details of how bad we used to be. And there are people who base their whole Christian careers on the person they used to be, traveling around and giving their story of how bad they were and now they're a Christian and, boy, isn't this great. But that isn't the best testimony. The people that have the best testimonies don't seem to get out there. What's a good testimony? Well, not going through all of that. So the easiest way to maneuver through life is not to have ever tried these things. You see, Pastor Bob, you're so strong, you know, you're not, you're not tested, tempted sexually. You're not, you don't have an addiction to drugs or to wine or all this stuff. And, and, uh, you know, I'm still a virgin, so I'm not tempted because I don't know the other side of that. I'm sure it'd be different if I did. It's one of the reasons why God tells 
us to, uh, to stay pure. I have a feeling that I'd have a problem with alcohol because I'm an addictive kind of person if I ever got started. So I've tasted wine a few times in my life, only at communion. Otherwise, I don't even know what beer tastes like. I've never tasted it. There are just some things that I've never started with. And so I never have to fight an addiction to stop. It's a big deal, isn't it? Being addicted to cigarettes or whatever it might be. But folks, there's something to be said for keeping your eyes on the prize and not glorifying the deeds of the flesh, whether it's in a testimony and wow, this is how bad I used to be and it gets worse and worse. And I've listened to people that travel and do that and I've listened to them from time to time, year to year, and they continue to embellish as they go and the stories continue to get worse and worse. I know. Isn't the greatest testimony the one where God keeps you, where you don't get involved in those things and God God calls you from a young age and I love my testimony. I wouldn't trade it for anything. But we glorify these other things and because we glorify, we put those people in offices far before they should be. And they don't qualify. I know this is a hard one today, but it's true. So what about the the, the sexual predator that we talked about the other day in restoring him. Well, of course we restore him. Of course we want him to do well. Of course we want to see him following the Lord. Do we put him in ministry? Well, no, he doesn't qualify. Do we put a person who has been struggling with uh, pedophilia in children's ministry? Of course not, of course not. The chances of him repeating that again are pretty great. You need to keep an eye on him. Love him to death. Love him. Restore him as much as you can. Give him all the grace you can. But positions of power and allowing him to be around the children in your church alone or any of that, absolutely not. And then there are people who have a, a sexual predator record. And some of those are people who were 16 years old having sex with somebody who's 15 or whatever the laws of the state might be. <laughs> yeah. So you never know the details of what that might be as well. Sometimes, and again, that's not the right thing to do, but then our whole society is not doing the right thing anyway. And so to cover up and to make things better in the world, people just go woke. They start saying, well, since I'm struggling with this whole thing, maybe I just need to change my sex. Instead of calling me he, call me she or them. Or it goes on and on. In the church, we say, let's show God's redemptive power. Let's put this person in a position of authority. Let's restore this person and pretend like nothing ever happened. Well, God forgives them as if nothing ever happened. But folks, trust is a long process. And sometimes that process may take years or decades. If it's somebody that that has a problem with sexuality, whether it's having sex with other women, whether it's pedophilia, whether it's being a sexual predator with a minor, whatever it might be, that isn't an easy restoration. It's important to restore their, them and, and redeem them in the sight of the Lord and help them in their walk with the Lord, but to put them in a place of any kind of importance 
or to put them in a place where you just let them do whatever they want anytime soon is foolishness. I think you understand what I'm saying. So it's a tricky subject, folks. But the bottom line is, when we come to Christ, there is full forgiveness of sin. He forgives us. The Bible says he washes our sins away as if they had never happened. But then I have to live it out. And living it out is a whole different thing. There's a difference between what we call sanctification and justification. Justification means just as if there was no such thing as sin. When God forgives me, I am completely forgiven. My sins are washed away. They are buried as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. The Bible says they're gone. They're gone as if they never existed. I am justified according to his death on the cross. Justification, it's instantaneous. It happens like that. Sanctification is the process I go through in my Christian faith. And I start from here and I continue to build on that foundation. And sanctification takes our whole life. It's the process of getting closer and closer to the Lord. It's a process of getting further away from my sin. It's a process of becoming the man or the woman that God intended me to be. Is that process quick? No. I've been a Christian for 65 years. I feel like I'm just getting started with that process. And I'm sure I'll feel that way up until the day I die. Yes. But folks, it's the justification that sets me free. And I can find my place in the body of Christ wherever I'm at. As long as I'm not expected to take a position that I'm not ready for and may never be ready for. Well, don't forget, folks, you are blessed. So go and be a blessing.